Kesson Corporation Meaningful Use Stage 2 Proposed Rule Overview Conference Call. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Philip Wilson. Please go ahead, sir. All right, thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, I, I too want to echo that I um, welcome you to the Meaningful Use Stage 2 Proposed Rule Overview. My name is Philip Wilson, and I'm an education specialist here at McKesson. I'm with the Physician Practice Solutions Academy, which is essentially the education department here at McKesson. We design um, documentation, videos, all kinds of educational resources, and we, we certainly do these kinds of webinars from time to time. I'm also part of what we call the Meaningful Use Strategic Team, or MUST Team, which is a, gr uh, a cross-functional group of us here at McKesson that uh, encompass people from our services team, our academy team, um, product uh, development, and we've all come together to help get meaningful use information out to our, our customers. And so uh, I'm the, the person that's heading up most of the, the customer-facing interaction uh, for the Meaningful Use Strategic Team. Let's go ahead and get started. So today's agenda, we're going to start with just a real brief Meaningful Use Overview uh, for those of you that may not be all that familiar with the, pro the program as a whole. And then we're going to get into Stage two and, and what it emphasizes, its timeline, and we'll go through the core and menu objectives and clinical quality measures, and we'll talk briefly about some changes to stage one that the stage two rule um, is proposing, and then at the end we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, certainly if you have any questions during the conference, feel free to use the Q&A button up at the top and put your questions in there, and I'll, I'll try to take a peek every now and then and see if there's anything um, that I could cover at that time. If we have any current customers on the line, um, just as a reminder, uh, the Meaningful Use Strategic Team, um, we do regular phone calls, um, and we do have calls scheduled for April 16th and April 30th that are going to be a little more specific to some of the subjects of Meaningful Use. And you can use the PPS Meaningful Use at mckesson.com email address if you uh, need any information about those calls, need the registration details. So real quick about Meaningful Use Stage 1, the first thing to, to be aware of is that it's definitely not too late to start. Um, we had some people that were very panicked at the end of last year or earlier this year who felt that if they didn't get their attestation done for 2011 that they were going to miss out on some of the, the incentives, and that's certainly not the case, and I'll show you that in a little bit, but just know it's certainly not too late to start. If, if you haven't attested yet, you've got just a 90-day just a, a period you have to meet. Um, sometime this year, if you want to attest for the first time in 2012. Um, be aware that you do have to pick the Medicare or Medicaid program, um, and then during the, the meaningful use life cycle, whatever it's going to be at this point, it looks like it might be five, six years, it could expand beyond that, but you can change programs once. So if you start in Medicare and you realize later you want to switch over to the Medicaid program, you can do that, um, but again, only once um, while you're meeting meaningful use. So let's talk about who is Medicare eligible. Um, these are going to be eligible professionals, um, including doctors of medicine or osteopathy, or, uh, dental surgery and dental medicine, uh, podiatry, optometry, and chiropractors. Um, the Medicaid eligible eligibility requirements are a little, um, a little more wide open. Um, it includes uh, all the, the same physicians as the Medicare program, but also nurse practitioners, certified, uh, certified nurse midwives, dentists, and physician assistants um, who furnish services at a federally qualified health center or rural health clinic that is led by a physician assistant. However, if you want to go the Medicaid route, be aware that you have to have a minimum 30% Medicaid patient volume, um, or if you're a pediatrician, it's a minimum 20% Medicaid patient volume, um, or if you practice predominantly in a federally qualified health center or rural health center, and have a minimum 30% patient volume attributable to needy individuals. So that will help you determine which program you're going to be eligible for. And then here we can look at what kind of incentives you'd be looking at depending on which program you select. So this is the Medicare payment schedule, and you'll see that if you qualify for the first time in 2011 or in 2012, you're eligible for total payments up to $44,000. If you don't get started on Meaningful Use for the first time until 2013, that's when you would see your incentives go down, and then they're going to continue to go down every year you delay meeting Meaningful Use. 
Um, also be aware that the plan right now is starting in 2015 to start reducing Medicare um, reimbursements um, by a small percentage that will grow over time. So if you choose not to meet meaningful use, um, you're not eligible for the incentives and you'll eventually get some Medicare reimbursement reductions. Here's the Medicaid payment schedule. And you'll see here there's actually no, um, you know, there's not a, a detriment to starting later. You can still get total incentive payments um, that are fairly significant, $63,750. Um, and you can get those really regardless of when you start, but obviously Medicaid, um, there's fewer people that are going to be eligible for that. But just to, to kind of give you an idea of what that schedule looks like. Um, real quick, let's just talk about some meaningful use statistics. Um, there's been over 211,500 physicians, hospitals, and critical access hospitals that have registered. And over 62,000 of those have actually um, started participating. And they've handed out $3.8 billion already for both the Medicare and Medicaid incentive programs. So there's um, a lot of money out there. People are getting paid. Um, so it's nice to see, you know, people starting to adopt it. I think we're going to see a lot more people adopt it this year for the first time, uh, especially as over time a lot of the questions, a lot of the confusion is getting cleared up. And I imagine that a number of you are, are here because you're, you're starting to really grasp on to meaningful use, and now you're curious what's going to come in Stage 2. Here's some important dates related to meaningful use. Um, October 3rd is going to be the last day for eligible professionals to begin their 90-day reporting period for this year. So if you do a plan to attest for 2012, you got to start by October 3rd in order to have that 90-day continuous window. Um, and then December 31st is the reporting year end for eligible professionals. And if you're going to attest for 2012, you have up until February 28th. So you can have your 90-day window any time this year up until October 3rd would be your last start date. You can attest any time up through February 28th of next year. Let's talk about Stage 2 now. Um, the, the rule emphasizes really, I think, four key areas. First is health information exchange, the ability for you to take your patient data and essentially transfer it, exchange it with another office, another physician, another hospital, and really what we're talking about is, is some uh, separate entity that likely has a different EHR, so you know, essentially interoperability may be able to, to exchange data between systems. Um, that's fairly big in stage two, the, the CMS is really pushing that. Patient engagement is another one, and you'll see that in a couple of the, the new objectives for stage two. They really want to get providers to engage their patients to use some of the, the new tools that are going to be required with Meaningful Use Stage 2. And we'll talk more about patient engagement in a little bit. Um, they're also tying clinical decision support to quality measures. So that's really talking about the tools that your EHR provides you to help you make decisions on patient care, tying those back to specific quality measures that are really aimed at improving the, the, the care and, and health of certain patient populations. And then flexibility, they are um, trying to you know, uh, increase the flexibility that providers and vendors will have in allowing them to meet meaningful use stage two. So you'll see in a, in a couple areas, they made it, a, um, I don't want to say easier, but they made it a little more flexible for you to meet some of the objectives. So here's a quick rundown of the timeline. In June 2011 or when the Stage 2 recommendations were first put together, and then the proposed rule came out February 23rd. The plan right now, um, from what I'm hearing, is late summer of this year is when the Stage 2 final rule is due. I think the latest I heard was uh, sometime towards the end of July. And then depending on whether you're a hospital or just an eligible provider, um, starting either October 2013 or January 1st of 2014 are, are when Stage 2 is actually going to start, and people will have to start meeting those, um, those uh, the new requirements, assuming they've already passed through Stage 1. So this graph here shows you which stage of meaningful use you would meet based on what year you start. And so if you started in 2011, if you did already a test for last year, you'll see that um, in 2013, there's that slightly colored box there that will show you 
you actually get three years on stage one before you have to meet the stage two requirements. If you start this year, um, you're going to end up meeting stage one for two years, then move on to stage two. And you'll see really any other year you start, whether it's 2013, 2014, you're going to spend two years on each stage. Two years on stage one, same on stage two, same on stage three. At this point, we don't know if there's going to be anything after stage three. That's why we've got the to be determined in the later years. But um, note that those that did a test for last year get a little bit of a break, and they get to stay on stage one for an extra year. So from a general standpoint, let's take a look at the, the objectives for stage two. As pretty much everyone expected, if, a, if an objective was considered a core objective, a required objective in stage one, it's still a stage two core objective. It's, if it was required before, it's going to be required in stage two with a couple of notable exceptions. The stage one menu objectives, as many people also predicted, by and large are now stage two core objectives. Things that were optional or essentially are optional right now under stage one are going to be required in stage two. And then for the stage two menu objectives, with really just one exception, they're brand new and you get to choose from those. So in stage one, you have 15 core objectives that everyone has to meet, and then there's 10 menu objectives, and you can select any five as long as one of them is it's either the syndromic surveillance or the immunization uh, data upload. With stage two, the numbers change a little bit, but you still have an overall, you're going to have to meet um, 20 objectives. There is, in stage two, at least under the proposed rule, there are 17 core objectives that everyone has to meet, and then there are five menu objectives, three of which you're going to have to select. So you're still going to have the same number of objectives in stage two, but they're broken up a little bit differently than they are in stage one. Let's actually go through the objectives so you can see what specifically you're going to have to do to meet stage two. And in a lot of cases, I'll point out how the stage two objective differs from the stage one objective. So we'll start with computerized physician order entry, or CPOE. And this is an expanded objective in stage two. It's going to require more than 60% of medication, laboratory, and radiology orders be placed in certified EHR technology. In stage one, you have to submit, you, know, you essentially have to enter 30%, and it's medication orders only. So they've doubled the requirement. Now you have to, to put in 60%, and they've expanded this objective. So you also have to enter in laboratory and radiology orders along with the medications. So that one is one of the larger changes here. It really expands the physician order entry you're going to have to do. For objective number two, is e-prescribing and formulary for more than 65% of all prescriptions. So e-prescribing in stage one is 40%. You have to e-prescribe 40% of the time of all permissible prescriptions. They've increased that to 65% and they took the formulary menu objective from stage one, which was optional, and they've rolled it into this objective. So now they've, they've really combined the two and now you have to do e-prescribing and formulary together on more than 65% of all prescriptions. So uh, not really a change here because uh, formulary was certainly optional under stage one, but they've combined a couple of, of pieces together. For objective number three is to record demographics for 80% of all patients. Previously, the, the threshold was 50%, so they increased the threshold but there's no changes in the required elements. There are five de demographic elements required in stage one. The exact same five are required in stage two. So all they did is just in increase the threshold you have to meet. Stage two proposed core objective number four is to record vital signs for more than 80% of all patients. This is another objective where they increased the threshold from 50% up to 80%. And they made a few slight changes. Um, height and weight have no age restrictions. You're really expected to, to calculate or to, to record height and weight for all ages. Blood pressure, however, they now are asking you to, to take for patients three years old or older. In stage one, it's age two or older. And they did receive a lot of feedback from pediatricians who said that they don't do blood pressure on two-year-olds. They wait until the patient is three. So the CMS listened 
and they did decide that starting in stage two, you'll only have to take blood pressure for patients that are three or older. Um, they also changed the exclusion here. So there were people that, that in stage one were trying to claim an exclusion to the entire vital signs objective by saying, well, we don't take blood pressure or height or weight aren't relevant to our practice, and then they would essentially exclude themselves from the vital signs objective completely. So in stage two, the CMS changed it, and now there are separate exclusions. If you don't take blood pressure, if that's not relevant to your practice, you can exclude yourself from that piece of it, but you're still going to be expected to take uh, or record height and weight. And then if you were somehow a, a practice that did not care about height and weight and it wasn't relevant to your practice, you'd still be expected to take blood pressure. So they, they split that up to, to prevent people from excluding themselves completely. For objective five under the stage two proposed rule is to record smoking status for more than 80% of all patients 13 years old or older. The, th the previous threshold was 50%, so they've increased that to 80%, but otherwise that objective is unchanged. For objective six is an interesting one. They are asking you to implement five clinical decision support interventions and do drug, drug, and drug allergy checking. So they've essentially combined two objectives. Clinical decision support was a core objective, and, and then drug, drug, drug allergy checking. They've, they've essentially rolled those into one objective in stage two. Um, previously, you only in stage one, you have to do one clinical decision support rule. So they changed the wording from rule to intervention. Really, they're not asking for anything different. I mean, intervention really isn't any different than a rule. I think the, the CMS just preferred the wording of intervention rather than rule. But now you have to uh, actually implement five clinical decision support interventions, and you need to tie them to clinical quality measures. And we'll talk about clinical quality measures um, in a little more in depth in a bit, but those are essentially the, the pieces where they're going to look at things like diabetes or weight management, you know, essentially calculate how often you're providing what the, the government feels is proper care for certain patient populations or segments of patients. And so they want the clinical decision support rules, the, the things that the EHR presents you with or, or provides you to help make decisions, they want those linked back to the clinical quality measures um, specifically. Um, and then also the, the drug, drug, and drug allergy checking has been rolled into this, and that is separate from the five clinical decision support interventions. So you can't claim that as one of the five. It's a completely separate piece. They just rolled it together because they feel drug, drug, and drug allergy checking is a clinical decision support intervention. For objective number seven is to incorporate structured lab results for more than 55% of all clinical lab test results. The threshold in stage one is 40%, so they increased that up to 55% for stage two. And this was a menu objective. Now they're going to make it a core objective, so everyone's going to have to meet that one. For objective eight is to generate at least one patient list by specific condition. That's a menu objective in stage one. They've made it a core objective for stage two, but otherwise it's the same. They didn't increase the number of lists. You simply have to generate at least one list of patients uh, by a specific condition. Core objective number nine is to use the EHR to identify and provide more than 10% of patients with reminders for preventative or follow-up care. This was a menu objective that they've now made a core objective, and they actually lowered the threshold. In stage one, you're required to, to send out reminders for 20% of your patients, and, and then there's age restrictions. So they lowered the threshold to 10%, and they removed the age restrictions. Stage one, your reminders need to go to patients that are five years old or younger, or 65 years old or older. And they got a lot of feedback from physicians saying, you know, in a lot of cases, that was not a relevant age group for their practice, or some physicians simply felt there were other segments of their patient population that would be better served by getting reminders. So the CMS listened and said, oh, all right, for stage two, no more age restrictions. You can send reminders to whatever segment of your patients you feel are going to be best benefited by them, and we're just going to require 10% of your patients to get them. Um, and so the 
the reminders, they've also added in that this is going to apply to all patients with an office visit within 24 months. So anyone you've seen in the last two years, essentially, are, are going to be the, the group that we're going to look at, and 10% of those people are going to need to receive reminders starting in Stage 2. All right, core objective number 10 is a big one. It is to provide patients the ability to view online, download, and transmit their health information within four business days of the information being available to the eligible provider. So we're talking about a patient portal. Now, there was a patient portal, or there, I should say, there is a patient portal piece in stage one, but it's really just allowing patients to view their data online. So not only is the patient portal going to be required, but Patients are going to need to be able to view, download, and transmit to some other entity their data. So there's a couple of measurements here. One is that more than 50% of all unique patients that are seen um, are going to be provided access to their data. So half your patients have to be given access to see it. And then more than 10% of all those patients um, are actually going to have to view, download, or transmit their data. So this is a patient engagement piece. I mentioned that earlier. One of the emphasize, uh, one of the things CMS is emphasizing for stage two is the. Um, um, excuse me, just a second. Um, is going to be patient engagement, and so um, what we're really looking at here is. Uh, providers are going to have to engage their patients to use the portal, and they're going to have to ensure that at least 10% of their patients actually do so. Um, that's going to be a really big piece here because this actually requires um, action on the part of the patient. The patient is going to have to log in, view their data, or download it or transmit it, and so physicians are really going to have to look at this objective and figure out how do we get our patients to actually use this new tool. You're going to have to have a portal if you're going to meet stage two. How do you engage your patients to use it? Um, and then I've got a little note here that just says you must provide the same information as included in the summary of care. And the summary of care has been expanded. Um, I'm not going to go into all the different pieces that are required, but there's a lot of information that will have to be provided on summaries of care for stage two. All that same information is going to have to be available on your patient portal. So there's going to be, a, essentially, just think of it as there's going to be a, a need for a lot of information to be available to the patient. Proposed stage two core objective number 11 is provide clinical summaries within 24 hours. So the 50% the threshold remains the same. In stage one, you need to give out clinical summaries to half your patients. That doesn't change in stage two, but they've shortened the time frame. So previously it was three days. Now you're going to be expected to provide clinical summaries within 24 hours. And they did increase the content requirements, um, like the summary of care. I'm not going to go through what all those requirements are because they're pretty lengthy, but just be aware that, you know, above and beyond what you may be providing now as part of stage one, there's going to be even more information that's going to be necessary. Um, that's going to be a big one. Really, I think the CMS is trying to get providers to, to get in the habit of giving this, this summary to the patient before they leave. Um, with the, the three-day uh, restriction in stage one, you've got a lot of providers that I think don't get the information into their EHR very quickly, so they may end up um, using mail or secure email to provide that summary later. So I think the CMS would like to see more patients walking out the door with their summaries. So shortening that time frame to 24 hours, I think, is one of the things they've done to try to increase that or to get providers to hit that goal. Core objective number 12 is to use the EHR to identify and provide education resources for more than 10% of all office visits. This was a menu objective that they've made a core objective, and they've slightly expanded um, the, the overall objective to cover all office visits instead of unique patients. In stage one, if you see a patient five times, you only have to give them an education resource once, and you're covered. Um, in stage two, it's going to be all office visits. So if you see that patient five times, they're essentially going to count in your denominator for the objective five times. And so, you know, it, it's going to be a little bit, probably a little bit harder to meet this objective because you're going to have to, to be aware that you can't give a patient uh, you see all the time a handout once and be covered for the entire reporting period. 
the percentage hasn't changed, so it's still just 10%. So the CMS realized that you know education probably doesn't have to go out all that often, so they didn't increase the, the percentage. They just changed um, the way that it's it's calculated. Core objective number 13 is another big one, and it's to use secure messaging for more than 10% of all patients. This is a brand new objective, was not in stage one at all. Um, it does require that the patient send the message. So you're, you need to have your patients sending you messages in order to meet this objective. So it's another patient engagement piece. Um, and it's, a, it's another one where I think people are gonna struggle because they're gonna try to figure out how do we engage our patients to use secure messaging and how do we teach them not only how to do it, but when it's gonna be appropriate to do it. Because really this is meant to be um, clinical-based information that the patient is, is you know, sending to the, the doctor or requesting help with. Um, just know that the providers are expected to respond, which I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but they made a point of it in the rule of saying, yes, you, you can't just have patients sending messages to a, a box that no one ever checks. The provider is expected to respond, but how they respond and what they respond with, you don't need to store. You don't have to, you know, the, you know, the physician can pick up the phone, call the patient, that works. Um, they can respond to the message. That's fine. You don't have to record any of that. You just um, there is an expectation that you will do so. It looks like we do have a question, so I'll take a quick look. Um, yeah, copy of the slide deck. Yes, a copy of the slide deck will be available after the the call. Um, all right, stage two, core objective number fourteen: perform medication reconciliation at more than sixty-five percent of all transitions of care. This was a menu objective, and they've made it into a core objective, and they increased the threshold from 50% to 65%. Um, one quick note about, um, or maybe it's not even that quick, but let me real quick talk about medication reconciliation and transitions of care. Um, by and large, a physician, I think most physicians will tell you, medication reconciliation should be done at every patient visit, or virtually every patient visit. Um, so the CMS, when they attach it to a transitions of care. They're not saying that you shouldn't do medication reconciliation all the time. What they're simply saying is they want to make sure you are documenting that you've done it on those transitions of care. And a transition of care is really some kind of an official handoff where you're referring the patient out to a specialist or the patient has been discharged from the hospital and they're coming back for follow-up at your office. So there's some kind of a, a true official handoff, usually some documentation, trading hands, and so you know, those are what the, the CMS looks at as transitions of care, and that's when they care about medication reconciliation. That's when they want to make sure you're really truly doing it is when that patient's med list may have changed due to that, that you know, referral or the visit to the hospital or what have you. So just a little more information about that. Core objective number 15 under the Stage 2 proposed rule is to provide summary of care documents for more than 65% of transitions of care and referrals with 10% sent electronically. So this is one of the big health information exchange pieces in stage two. Um, this was a menu objective and they've determined that it really needs to be required for everybody. They've increased the, the threshold. It was 50% before, now it's 65% and they expanded it to include the electronic component. So of those, summary of care documents you provide, at least 10% have to be provided electronically, and that's where they're really trying to get systems to talk to each other. You know, definitely different EHRs, different vendors, they want them being able to exchange information, and so this is one of their pushes. Um, and one of the things they did when they made this menu objective for stage one a core objective for stage two is they rolled in three of the stage one core objectives into it. Um, the objective is to maintain an up-to-date problem list, maintain an active medication list, and maintain an active medication allergy list. Those are all essentially gone in stage two because they've been rolled into the summary of care objective. Your summary of care must include problem list, medication list, medication allergy list. So because you have to have that information to provide summary of care documents, and because summary of care documents are a required part of stage two, they figure you're gonna to have to maintain those anyway. So they've essentially done away with them and rolled them into this objective. 
for objective number 16 is the successful ongoing transmission of immunization data. This is another really big one. This was a menu objective in stage one. Um, and in stage one, you were simply required to do one test. And if your test was unsuccessful, you still met the objective. So not only now is this a required piece for stage two, but you have to have the successful ongoing transfer. Um, it'll just be a yes-no attestation when you go to a test. You say, yes, we're doing it, or no, we're not. Um, and you have to report which public health agency the data is going to, I imagine, so that you know, the CMS can do a little checking up on it. But um, this is, is going to be a big piece because we're going to have to figure out how does every single practice get the ability to transmit immunization data to a registrant. Um, certainly, we've it's been a struggle for years, you know, even before meaningful use, Building immunization interfaces to states could be very difficult because many times you had states have their own specific requirements or they wanted slightly different format of the data than what might be considered industry standard. So this is a big piece and I think this is going to be a push not only for customers but for vendors and for the registries themselves to really standardize what data is going to be sent, the format that it comes in, et cetera. So this is a, a big piece to stage two. Um, and then the final core objective for stage two is to conduct or review security analysis and incorporate in risk management process. So this is identical to the stage one objective. Just be aware you have to do it every year. Every year you attest, you need to do a, a new um, security risk analysis and obviously then make any adjustments that might be necessary based on that analysis. So you can't just do it once and use that same analysis every year, you're gonna to have to do it fresh each year you, you plan to attest. Stage two menu objectives. So first um, is to incorporate more than 40% of imaging results. And by imaging results, they mean scans or tests whose result is one or more images. So the data doesn't need to be structured data. Um, so if you've got the image and any accompanying data, um, doesn't have to be structured data, and you can also link to this information, so you don't actually have to store the image inside your EHR. You simply have to be able to get to it through some kind of a link. Um, obviously, you can store it directly in the EHR. That's fine as well. Um, they are considering including a second measure here that would require the exchange of imaging and results. So not only would you have to be able to view 40% of images um, imaging results in the EHR, you'd have to have the ability to transfer that those images to some other entity, some other practice, et cetera. Um, they don't know if they're going to include that in the final rule or not. I think they're taking feedback from, uh, from physicians, but you know, they're, they're at least thinking about it. Let's take a quick look. Um, if a dermatologist refers a patient for Mohs surgery for one skin cancer only and expects to see the patient back yearly for skin checks, is this considered a transfer of care? Um, that's a, you know, that probably gets into it a little bit of a gray area. Um, certainly, if you're, you, you refer the patient out and they go and they have the surgery and then they come back at some point, yeah, it's probably a transfer of care. I mean, the, the CMS typically, I think they look at a, a transfer of care as there is some kind of exchange of data. So if you're being, if the patient's being transferred into your care, you're getting a package, whether it's paper or an electronic file, with information about that patient, you know, any new meds. Um, you know, the diagnoses, you know, whatever it might be. So that to me is what I think of as a transfer of care, but the, the CMS is, you know, has not really given us truly um, what I would call a, a clear cut definition of what a transfer of care is. In my eyes, that probably would be, but if, you know, if you see them once and for a, a normal checkup and then they don't need to come back for another year, uh, again, maybe after that first time after they've had the surgery, yes, it's probably a transition of care. After that, I don't know that it would be simply because um, they aren't really being transferred. They're simply coming back for follow-up care. Um, but I think you have some leeway if you want to call that a transfer of care and you want to do medication reconciliation. I don't think the CMS would have any issues with you doing that. So I hope that answers the question. We'll return back real quick to the Stage 2 menu objectives. Um, number two is to record family health history for more than 20% of all patients. So this is going to be required to be structured data entry, and they're looking at first-degree relatives, so really you're looking at um, you know, parents, siblings, um, that kind of thing. So you know, 
don't know what kind of information is going to be expected at this point. I haven't seen a lot of details, but this is going to be one of the menu objectives is to, um, to record family health history. The remaining three menu objectives are all the successful ongoing transmission of data to a registry. So number three is syndromic surveillance data to a public health agency. This was a menu objective in stage one. They chose to leave it as a menu objective in stage two. And the biggest reason is that they ultimately decided that a lot of public health agencies were not prepared to accept electronic data. And so because there, you know, there's still like a struggle for many public health agencies to receive this data, they chose not to make this a core requirement. Um, they're going to leave it as a, um, as a menu objective. And just note that it, in stage one, the transmission of syndromic surveillance data does not have to be successful or ongoing. You simply have to test the ability to do so. And if you fail, you still meet the objective. Stage two, we're talking successful ongoing. Um, Objectives four and five are the transmission of cancer case data to a cancer registry and then specific care information to specialized registries. These I think have gotten, uh, I think some people are confused about these. I've even heard from a cancer doctor that was not aware there was uh, any cancer registries that they could submit cancer data to. So you know, we'll have to see if they clarify some of this in the final stage two rule. But this is more of the health information exchange, and they, they roll a lot of it into the menu objectives, but um, it is successful ongoing transmission. So they are looking at, you know, if, if you're going to pick these, these objectives, you're going to have to be successful in transferring your data. Um, these are all going to be yes, no attestations, and you're going to have to report which public health, health agency the data is going to. Got another question. When you say 20% of all patients, they mean all practice population, not just Medicare patients. Um, unfortunately, I'm, um, I think you're probably, re you may be referring back to the, the requirements to um, actually add some Medicare patients. I'm, unfortunately, I don't quite know what this question is. Perhaps if you want to hold on to that one and then ask it in the audio Q&A, we'll do at the end. Um, that might be best, and I'll do my best to answer it. So there were a couple of stage one core objectives that were eliminated in stage two. So the first is the exchange of key clinical information. This was a really confusing objective for many people, and the CMS ultimately decided that it's really covered by the transitions of care objective in stage two anyway. You're going to have to be providing transitions of care. So because of that, you know, the ability to exchange key clinical information really is, is essentially the same thing. So they, they decided that there's no reason to keep the exchange of key clinical information. They also eliminated providing an electronic copy of the patient's health information. And the reason for that is if you've got, if you're going to be required to have a patient portal, you're going to be providing the patient's information online. So why do you, you know, you don't need to provide an electronic copy for a patient when you can simply point them to the portal and say your information is available there. So those two objectives that were required in stage one simply go away. Um, you may have noticed that one of the things I did not talk about, which was a core objective in stage one, is clinical quality measures, or CQM. It is no longer an objective. The CMS has now decided that clinical quality measures are really a, a part of being a, a, reporting on them is part of being a meaningful EHR user. So clinical quality measures are simply, I think of it as just a third piece to meeting meaningful use. You have core objectives, you've got menu objectives in stage two, and then you're going to have clinical quality measures, which is just going to be a third piece that you're going to have to meet. Um, they are looking at, at allowing group reporting of clinical quality measures, which will make it much easier to report on them instead of having to break it out, especially large practices having to break out the numbers for every single provider. They're going to allow you to report um, your, your totals as a group. There are 125 potential clinical quality measures that they're considering for stage two, and they just, I think, posted the full list with, you know, in the last couple of days. And they'll take public comment and then finalize a subset of those for stage two. And they have outlined a process for electronic submission of this data. Currently, when you go to a test, you simply key your, your information in during the attestation process. You don't have to uh, provide any kind of a file or, or you know, more specific proof. So they're looking at um, the electronic submission process, but most likely it'll still be, uh, it won't
won't be required in stage two. Um, I suspect in stage three it will be. Um, there are two proposals for handling of clinical quality measures um, for stage two. One is that each provider would have to report on 12 clinical quality measures with at least one from six different domains, and I've got the domains listed there. That's one of the proposals. The other is that each provider would have to report on 11 core clinical quality measures, and then they would get to pick one, uh, one menu uh, clinical quality measure from a larger list. So they're, again, they're going to take public comment on these to determine is it better to get lots of good data about 11 core clinical quality measures and allow people to pick one more, or is it more important that people, that, that physicians report on a variety of clinical quality measures across different domains and allow them a little more flexibility in selecting which ones they want to meet? And that, that plays into the flexibility piece with um, stage two. And as I mentioned before, there, the, the stage two proposed rule does uh, throw out some ideas for changes to stage one. And these would be changes to the way the CPOE objective is measured. Um, it, it would allow the age limitations for vital signs and the exclusions as well to become part of stage one. That's essentially um, being able to take blood pressure on patients three or older instead of two, and then splitting your exclusions between blood pressure or height and weight. They're, they're proposing to have those rolled, really rolled into stage one. Um, removal of the exchange of key clinical information, which we talked about. Um, certainly it's not part of stage two, but they're actually looking at eliminating it for stage one. Um, it's not guaranteed, but they're actually considering some other options um, about maybe making it required that it's successful exchange, because right now you simply have to do a test, and if, if it's unsuccessful, you're fine. So there's different things around the exchange of key clinical information. I think they have four different proposals out there, but the one that they're actually pushing for is simply to remove the exchange of key clinical information core objective from stage one, which would make stage one a little bit easier to meet. Um, and then they're also looking at replacing the electronic copy um, measure with a view online, download, and transmit core measure. So, you know, they're looking at saying, well, if you're going to have to have a portal, maybe we'll remove the electronic copy out of stage one and replace it with the view online, download, and transmit core measure. So these changes likely wouldn't have take, certainly not going to take effect this year, um, and they'll, I think, be optional. Everything I've seen says they would be optional in 2013. So, for example, the way you, you, you uh, measure the, the CPOE objective or the, the changes to the vital sign objective, those would be optional. You could, you could meet stage one either way, either measuring CPOE in the, the old stage one or the, the new stage two option. Um, et cetera. So, you know, they're, they're looking at, at making them optional in 2013, but then in 2014, if you're on stage one in 2014, you would have to meet the, the slightly changed versions. So what's next for stage two? Um, right now we're in the 60-day public comment period, and that ends May 7th. Um, you can make comments about the stage two proposed rule at www.regulations.gov. You do have to, to poke around a little bit to, to find where you can do it, but you, I think if you search for Stage 2 or Meaningful Use Stage 2 on that website, you can find the location where you can enter in your comments. And as I mentioned before, the final rule is due in late summer. I think towards the end of July is the current plan, but we'll see. So real quick, let's just talk about um, McKesson's products. Um, we do have Meaningful Use Certified products. We have our practice partner, EHR, We've got an integrated scheduling and billing program, and it can interface with Paragon, uh, Paragon or other practice management programs. Um, and then really it's the Metasoft Clinical and Litech MD uh, products are essentially the same EHR's practice partner, but they're linked up to different practice management programs. Metasoft Clinical is linked to Metasoft, Litech MD is linked to Litech uh, through interfaces. Um, so we offer essentially the, the same EHR across those three um, those three products. They just link to different billing, pro uh, or I should say, practice management programs. And then we have a new uh, product called McKesson Practice Choice, which is a SaaS-based solution. If you don't know what SaaS is, that's software as a service. It's essentially where we host the program for you and. You connect into it over the Internet. You don't have to worry about things like having a server with all the data on it. You don't have to worry about backups. You don't have to worry about upgrades. We do all the upgrades automatically. So that's a new um, 
a new product that we've got out for some of our smaller groups. Um, and all of these products are certified for meaningful use. And then just to, to let you know what McKesson offers in terms of meaningful use support, I mentioned before the Meaningful Use Strategic Team, or MUST team. We have a dedicated email address for our customers to send questions. They, anyone who wants to can submit a question there, and usually within 48 hours we'll get, respond to those. Um, we do regular webinars that are open to all customers. Uh, they're similar to this, but we can certainly, we do more specific ones where we, we might look at particular objectives for meaningful use, how to meet them, how to configure the system for them, etc. Um, we have a discussion board where there are document, all kinds of documents, links to CMS documentation. We, we post announcements regarded to, related to meaningful use or the meaningful use strategic team. Um, that's available to all our customers. And then we do sell what we call meaningful use consulting services. If you really want some dedicated help with a meaningful use expert at McKesson, you can purchase a package which includes an assessment. We take a look at your workflow, you know, how you're, you're doing in terms of meeting the, the various objectives. We provide feedback and then time to help um, either do configuration in the system or help work through any workflow changes that might need to, to take place in order to allow you to meet the meaningful use objectives. But we've got some questions, so I'll take a, a quick look at these. Um, how is a geriatric practice affected by the patient portal requirement when most patients over the age of 65 aren't computer literate? That is certainly one of the concerns that I have seen voiced about that particular one. Same thing really with the, um, with the secure messaging piece. There are exclusions available that say if, if you've got a patient population where they simply don't use computers, don't have access to computers, uh, you know, even not just geriatric patients, but if you've got, you know, places uh, in the country where very little, you know, very few people have access to high-speed Internet, which is really required to use these things. Um, so there are some exclusions available. I haven't looked at all the details, but I do know there are exclusions available if you can, you know, provide some kind of information saying we don't have patients that are capable of using these tools. So I think, you know, you're probably going to be covered in those cases. Um, is there a process in place for certification for meaningful use software for Stage 2? If so, where does McKesson stand in the process and will the Horizon Ambulatory Care product be seeking certification? Uh, I honestly can't speak to the Horizon Ambulatory Care. I suspect they would be seeking certification, but I don't know that for sure. Um, we are right now, at this point, we've, we've got the proposed rule. We're in the process now of just sort of taking it in and determining on our side what are going to be the best ways to, to improve our products to meet all the Meaningful Use Stage 2 um, rules. So we've certainly, you know, we're, we're planning to, to, um, to get ourselves certified for Meaningful Use Stage 2 as soon as we can, and it will be based on partially when they actually open up certification. I mean, obviously, the Stage 2 final rule needs to come out first. We don't know what's going to be in the, the Stage 2 final rule. Things may change, um, and if they make changes, those certainly could affect our development timeline. But based on when the certification process starts and our development timeline, we're going to do everything we can to get our products certified as soon as possible. Um, you don't see Horizon Ambulatory Care on your list of certified products. Um, I don't, honestly, I, I apologize, I don't deal much with uh, HAC. I don't, um, I can certainly look into trying to get some information about um, HAC and determine if there's any, uh, any changes there. Looks like we've got a couple of questions. You know, we have McKesson's Horizon Ambulatory Care is a certified software. Um, I don't know. We've got one, a couple of people from marketing on. I don't know if, Lisa, if you might be available to comment on HAC or not. Certainly see if I can look into whether HAC is certified, and if, uh, if not, if there are plans to do that. Where are the links found? Is this on the McKesson website? I'm not sure which links you might be referring to. So that might be one if you want to, we're going to open it up to, to audio Q&A here in just a minute after we get through the questions in here. So um, that would might be one where you could ask since I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Uh, will you have the slides available after the presentation? Yes, that was asked earlier, and yes, we will definitely make the slides available. Uh, comment, patient engagement may include both patients and families. Thus, if a patient sees a geriatric provider, 
is not used to patient portal, their children and or caregivers may be able to utilize the data on their behalf with patient's authorization or shared access. And that's a very good point, yes. The, um, you know, there, there may be, I haven't seen if the rule specifically goes into that, to be honest. I have not read through the entire 455 pages of the Stage 2 rule, but uh, I would not be at all surprised if they built that in um, to indicate that, yes, maybe you've got patients that they themselves don't, aren't computer literate, can't use these tools, but they may have family that could assist. In any of the objectives starting stating a percentage of patients, is it percentage of all patients, percentage of Medicare patients only? This, okay, okay. That is percentage of all patients that are seen during the reporting period, not just those that are Medicare or if you choose a Medicaid program, Medicaid. Um, you are expected to do the, to meet these objectives for all of your patients regardless of their insurance coverage. It looks like we've gone through the Q&A online, and you can certainly submit uh, more there if you want, but I think at this time we could go ahead and open it up, open up the, the call for any, anyone who wants to, uh, to ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. If you'd like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Please be aware that a voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line is open. At that time, please state your name before posing your question. And once again, that's star one to ask a question. We'll pause a moment and allow the queue to assemble. Hey, it's not look like we have any questions over the phone. Okay. Well, then I just want to thank everyone for, actually, it looks like we do have um, one more question here. If reporting is for all patients, how do we capture for using claims-based. Um, well, ultimately, you know, the EHR has to be able to capture when patients are actually seen. So it really depends on your software. Certainly the, the McKesson products are all built so that they capture a visit. They know what a patient visit is. We use a concept called the clinical encounter in the practice partner, Metasoft, uh, and LightTac EHRs. So they will, they will capture that information so you'll know simply that the patient was seen. Uh, practice Choice has a similar uh, piece built into it where it knows um, that a patient has been seen on a specific date, and then they end up be, you know, counting towards most of the performance metrics that you have to meet for the stage. So it really comes down to your EHR. I certainly can't comment on other EHRs that may use different methods, um, but you know, all of our products are set up to, to know when a patient has been seen so that they can be included in those, those performance metrics. Um, is McKesson working with regional extension centers? Um, certainly, I get uh, I get emails and calls from regional extension centers pretty regularly. Um, we don't have, uh, by and large, I don't think we've got any sort of official um, channels worked out with RECs, but their RECs certainly contact us uh, quite a bit, and we I help them out whenever I can. I know our support team helps them out whenever they can. So we do whatever, whatever we can to help support regional extension centers, um, and I certainly deal with them on a pretty regular basis as they try to help um, their uh, their local practices meet meaningful use. Philip, this sorry. is Lisa. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, sorry, this is Lisa Santos. I'm part of the marketing team, and I'm sorry I didn't talk earlier when you, I think I was on mute, but as far as regional extension centers, uh, the McKesson Physician Practice Solutions Business Unit, which um, Philip is presenting on here today, does have positive relationships with nearly 40 of the regional extension centers across the nation. Um, that's probably why Philip gets questions a lot, because we are dealing closely with a lot of the extension centers. Um, so if you do have one locally, I would suggest reaching out to us to see if we're working closely with them um, so they could help you with consulting on the, um, the objectives as well for each stage. And then I just wanted to comment on the Horizon Ambulatory Care. They were certified for the Stage 1, and um, they're not um, exactly part of the business unit that we work closely with, but I'm sure just as we're going through um, prepping for Stage 2 and going to go through certification once available, I'm sure Horizon Ambulatory Care will be doing the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so, sorry, we were referring to the must links and discussion boards information. Okay, so um, the, the meaningful use strategic team does, I, I have mentioned, they have an email address, PPS, meaningful use, at mckesson.com um, that I mentioned earlier. That is for our customers. So if you are a customer, you can certainly send us questions there. Um, if you aren't, but you, you just want to try to get in touch with somebody, you could certainly send an, inf uh, an email there, and I'd be happy to try to, to point you in the right direction. The discussion board, um, if you're interested 
Um, again, this is for customers only because you do have to have a customer sign in, but it's at um, HTTPS um, let's see, forum.practicepartner.com. And I'll see, um, maybe what I can do is try to add a slide to the, the slide deck before we send it out that will have that. But um, that, that forum is available to our customers. They have a customer sign in and they can get onto the discussion board and post, review what's there, et cetera. And then how will we get the documents for this webinar? Um, if you register, uh, I think, Lisa, you may be able to come in this. I think the plan was to email out a copy of the, the documents to everyone that, that had registered. Yep, that is correct. Okay. Like we don't have any more questions, so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to attend, and hopefully I was able to give you some good information, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. That does conclude our call for today. We appreciate your participation.